everybody, and welcome to another Matilda Book Club brought to you by Penguin Young Readers and Matilda the Musical, now on Broadway in London's West End. With me, we have two special guests in honor of Doll Month here in New York and in London. We have Roll Doll's daughter, Lucy. Hello, Lucy. Hello. And nice to see everybody again, although I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Roll Doll's granddaughter, Chloe. Hello, Chloe. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. So we have two lovely doll ladies to talk to us about Doll Month. Um, and as it turns out, it was Chloe's birthday today, so we all have our birthday party hats on. Um, in honor of this month's book, which was fantastic, Mr. Fox. So Chloe obviously is a bunny rabbit, and Lucy and I are foxes. Thank you very See, much. See, there's the hat. Show That's the right. Get the hat to the ring. So Roald Dahl's birthday is tomorrow, and Lucy, I just wanted to ask you and Chloe both, what were birthdays like growing up in your house? Well, in my house, they were when I was a child, they were a really big deal. They were they were incredibly fun. My birthday is in August, so I was always really pleased that I never had to go to school on my birthday. And so I always had a, what we called a swimming party on my birthday. And we um, had a swimming pool, which was sort of unusual in the, in the early, late 60s and early 70s. Um, and so it was a big deal for all my friends from school to come over and... and um, we had a cake that was that was that was built like a pool. We had the same cake every year, and it was a real specialty cake, which now they're a dime a dozen. But back then, they they really weren't. It was really fun. It was a really big deal. That's so fancy. And Chloe, what did you get for your birthday today? What what happened? What were the big oh, traditions? Well, well, I got a T-shirt. Oh, well done. <laughs> and well, this morning, even though I am 23 today, I still showed up at my mom's house, even though I don't live here. And the kitchen was decorated with streamers. Nice. And we had a breakfast coffee cake that you get from this freezer section of Pavilion that we have every year. And then we spent the whole day and hopefully we'll go see a movie later this afternoon and then go out to dinner. That sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. Well mm -hmm. done. Well done. What, what kind of eats are you thinking about? What's the, the genre of food we're talking? Tonight? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like French food. Oh, Isn't kind of like French food similar? We're going to Chef Ludo's restaurant. Oh, excuse me. And it's a it's a set menu. So and you it's all quite fashionable. You have to make a reservation at a certain time and sign in and hope mm -hmm. to get a table and pay in advance. And wow. but Chloe managed it. Chloe got us in. But so. unlike her, I've always enjoyed that my birthday was in September and in school because my mom always made me a birthday cake no matter what I was into that year. So I had one with knights and horses, one with trolls, Whoa. and it was always a homemade cake that I could take to school. And then so I really enjoyed breath. getting all the attention for that. So totally. today I don't get a I don't get a cake today though, but I will get a Victoria sponge cake this weekend. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't had time to make the cake. <laughs> well, you've brought the Sara Lee. What's the problem? I know. I know. <laughs> Nobody does it like it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, speaking of fantastic feasts and segueing into our monthly book club, which I'm sure everybody read their homework. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody who sent their questions in. Um, I do want to ask Chloe, as long as we have you here, about your fantastic fox story. Well, every time we've gone to England, we've always uh, gone and looked at the witch's tree, which is the fantastic Mr. Fox tree, mm. which was called the witch's tree. For mm. some we reason. called it the witch's tree. I don't know why, but we did. And it was up a, a stone lane with tiny little rocks and hedges, and it was just a tree by itself. And our mom used to take me and my older sister there when we were younger and tell us about how the three farmers would always sit there waiting for the fox to come out. So my sister and I would go there alone sometimes and wait for the after lunch and wait for the fox, but... That is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, way to wait it out. I appreciate that. The so, but, however, she did find a tail, didn't you? I Chloe? did. I did find a tail. Oh, <laughs> that's a fox! That's a fox tail. I'm glad it was a clean break there. It looks like a clean break. Well done. <laughs> it's actually a tie. Oh, you're kidding? <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, my gosh. So, what? I mean, obviously the story was written, Chloe, probably before. Before you were born, I mean, what year was it written? Um, do you, is that where the, the story came from, from this fox tree? I believe so. I believe all the stories came from little things around the house in England. 
So cool. So cool. Yeah, yeah, no, it did. It, um, uh, Mr. Fox lived under a tree. Uh, it was a beautiful, massive tree. It's actually three beech trees grown into one. So you could also climb. Remember climbing up there? You mm -hmm. could climb into it, and it had like a platform, um, a large platform, the, the size of a couple of desks, um, big desks. And then you could go on and climb um, beyond that. So it was it was just an amazing uh, system of trees. Uh, and under underneath it, at its base, there were holes. There were fox holes. Oh my gosh! Um, and my father, with this story in particular, he wrote about everything in the woods around where we lived, in the, um, in the woods, up the lane, all the wildlife, and, and we did also have farmers around us, one, two, three farmers around us, so like all his other stories, it was an exaggerated uh, uh, truth of, of real life, of what happened in real life. And uh, a fun little story is that I remember this very well, um, at night time, Sometimes, not. We, I think I remember. I think maybe we did it twice, but I, mm. I will never forget it. He used to um, bring a, fill a thermos full of hot chocolate, and we would walk up the lane very late at night, and we would sit quietly in the woods waiting for the the nocturnal animals to come out, the badgers and the moles, because he was obviously interested in them because he was he was writing about them, and um, we didn't have babysitters and oftentimes my mother was working out of the country so he used to just take us with him um, and to us it was a fantastic adventure. That sounds like the farmers waiting it out inside, outside the hole like it sounds like yes. Bugs, Bogus and Bean like just sort of camped out waiting for somebody to show up. It is that's probably that's, that's probably had something to do with it as well because and they did come out the badgers they would come out and peer around, and and it was it was all just tremendously exciting. Aren't badgers super mean in nature? I mean, like fairly aggressive. They didn't go after us. Oh, that's good news. <laughs> we used to have a lot of raccoons in Maine, so you know, similar. Lots of little tiny hands reaching for you. Action city. <laughs> Chloe, did you grow up in LA? I grew up in LA. So how many wild animal stories do you have in the city? Wild animal stories, yes, not that's very right. many. No? Not very many, no. I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm not how, lo how long has the pig been uh, in, in the family? Oh, your, ten your years. Pig. Ten so years? That's, he's a wild animal now. He's pretty crazy. Yeah, I, yeah, and I've had a hamster before and okay. <laughs> a bunny rabbit, but they're not too wild. But <laughs> it's fair enough. And a parrot. We and had a, parrot. a parrot. We had a parrot. We had a parrot. A parrot with a crooked And feet. frogs. See? Yeah. And turtles. And turtles. And you know, I think my mother's actually kept that doll spirit alive with the exact with making things exciting because when we were little, she would wake us up at midnight. My sister and I, when we we, we were in the same room, she'd come and she'd with the lights off, she'd wake us both both up and say that there was a feast downstairs, and we'd walk downstairs and she prepared an entire midnight feast. And that happened once or twice. <laughs> what? Yeah. I I did I I did um. As a parent myself, I did all the best things that my dad did with us. So, because it was just brilliant. Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> so, what was at the feast? Was it just a, a it bean feast? It was tea. It was it was everything. There were cookies. It was a midnight feast. Was it tea in the night? I think so. Or hot chocolate. <laughs> hot, cho hot chocolate. Sorry. Caffeine. <laughs> Sorry. Tea in the afternoon. Chloe, you know better than that. I'm tea at night, outrageous. <laughs> We're not savages. <laughs> My God. Uh, speaking of a feast, um, I love the bit in the story where the animals get kind of drunk, or the rat is the rat who sort of protects the um, cider is ratty. Cider. Um, it just it's so hilarious, and it's also really bold. I love that he trusts kids to know like it's okay. The rat's drinking cider. He's allowed to be drunk. Did he ever well, talk to you guys about that? We had, um, gosh, I wish, I wish I could take you all around the house and show you the house because it was really a phenomenal house and and its grounds and and um, just magical. But but we had a cellar uh, that was filled with 
um, food, like Christmas pudding. My father would make the Christmas pudding uh, a year ahead of time, and that would sit down in the cellar. He was a he wow. was a big wine collector, and the the wine would be down in the cellar. We also had a, an apple orchard, and um, he would make cider, and that would ferment down in the cellar. Um, so we probably did have a rat down there. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I also still appreciate do. He has like a very nice long straw because he's sort of a gentleman just sort of sipping on the enormous cider jug the whole time. I love that. Well, that's, I mean, speaking of which, he has, I think we've talked to Lucy about, you know, is the BFG based on role or, you know, which characters best um, represent him. Of the three farmers, um, Bogus, who does chicken and dumplings, Buns, who's donuts and goose liver, and Bean with the cider. Which one do you think he would have been? Or mm. Bean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So which one are you two? Bean. Ah! <laughs> you are Bean, actually. <laughs> Your mom's right here. I would, I would actually say that I was bogus. The goose liver, the goose liver, and, and what was the other thing? Donuts and goose liver is bunts. And what was bogus? Bogus is chicken, chicken and dumplings. No, I like goose liver. Yeah. I know you're not supposed to eat foie gras in the world. Um, but when you were allowed to eat it, I loved it. <laughs> and donuts, what's not to love? I'm sorry, but donuts, donuts are good. I don't drink, so but I, I, I would have, I would have in the days that I did drink, I would have drunk some cider. I would have been a uh, bogus over bumps. I you love do. dumplings. Yeah, yeah. dumplings and cider. I'd like to combine the two. Okay, well I accept. You win. You get to be both. <laughs> There was actually, I've got so many things to tell you about this mm. story that, that, that um, I just need to jump in. Do there it. was a farmer, there was, uh, there were, as I said, there were three farms. One farmer um, in particular, shot, he shot our dog um, oh. and killed it. And I think that that's probably where Bogus and Bunsen and Bean came from. The, the farmers in the village, the Reddings, they were great friends of us, and they used to keep their cows in our apple orchard. In fact, it was great because it cut the grass down, as my dad used to say. <laughs> and uh, when I was bored and I wanted a bit of action, I would, when no one was looking, I would open the gate to the orchard uh, in the evening. And then in the middle of the night, my dad would wake us all up and say, everybody out of bed, the cows are, the cows have got out, they're in the village. And we'd all have to screech down the road in, our, in, in the little car and, and round up the cows. And so that was fun. But back to, back to the, the not so nice farmer, we had a, a dog and uh, he chased the sheep in the field next door. Yeah. And the farmer threatened and said, if you don't stop your, your dog from chasing the sheep, I'm, I'm going to kill it. And my father tried everything. He put up fences around, and and um, but it was it's such a sprawling countryside. It's very hard to fence the whole thing in. And then um, I remember one time there was a hole that the dog used to run through to get to the sheep field, a hole in the hedge. And uh, my father one day he sat behind the hole waiting for Jack to come, uh, the dog to come through. And when the dog came came through, my father would jump out at him to scare him to try and stop him from from coming. But he, he couldn't stop him, and the farmer oh, shot him. On so purpose, I think that, too. It, sounds that, like it was on purpose. Yeah, so I think that that might have been uh, uh, a lot of the inspiration towards towards that story. Definitely. The jerk. What was the dog's right? name? Jack. Oh. <laughs> That's the saddest thing ever. Jeez. It's pretty sad, actually. That's it's awful. Pretty sad. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But a good story came out of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, speaking of a good story, it's also a pretty great movie, Wes Anderson movie. Um, do you? I mean, I'm, I know you guys both love it, but Lucy, do you remember when it was being made and you know your thoughts on it in general? I wasn't a part of this particular film when it was being made, as an active part of it, but um, I do know that Wes Anderson he went and stayed at our house. In, in the countryside where, where we all lived. Yeah. And um, he spent a long time writing in my father's work hut, writing the script in the actual hut. And um, he, he brilliantly and very cleverly took a lot of props from around the house, not even props, chairs, pictures, paintings, uh, tables. And he had them all create, recreated in the film. So when you watch the film, Anybody wouldn't recognize it, but if you've been to our house, it's not in Mr. Fox. It's yeah. It was all, it's not the um, 
it's not the same layout, obviously, but the the chairs are all the chair is exactly the same, recreated. The the desk is the same. The pictures on the wall. If if any of you decide to watch the film again now, um, I'm not sure where it is, but in the background of one of the scenes, there's a a happy birthday. Speaking of birthdays, ah. a happy birthday um, that's written in in flower petals that I did that I I stuck on paper out of flower petals and made happy ah. birthday. And he had that in his hut, and uh, that was reproduced into into the film. And even my father's clothes, the the clothes that Mr. Fox wears, are replicas of clothes from my father's closet. It's kind of I, kind of amazing. It's amazing. Well, yeah. I, I feel like I recognize like maybe it's when he wears those sandals, like the BFG style sandals that he wore. Yeah. He talks about wearing I think in Boy and things, but it's so specific when you see it. It's it has to have come from inspiration. It's so cool. That's what it was from. And then you let him in your house. That's pretty great. Well, and, and the fact that he wrote a lot of the film sitting in my dad's chair in my work, dad's work hut. I mean, he and and he went for long walks in the woods where you know the animals were. He saw uh, the witch's tree, the fox's tree, and oh, spent yeah. a lot of time there. So, so as a um, it, it couldn't have been any better. I just think it was brilliant. And and that song. Bobby some bumps and me, yeah. that would you would lean, da, 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 and it stays in you. I'm sorry if I just put oh, totally. everybody's head no. for another three weeks. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> have you, I mean, you're a writer. Have you spent a lot of time in that writing hut and done writing yourself there? No, no, mm. I have because for me it's a different place. I don't yeah. go in there and look at the hut and think, um, you know, that's where these these masterpieces were written. I think. Ooh, that's where I would go when I wanted to ask for something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like some, like some money or something like that, because you didn't go and bother him when he was working unless it was necessary or if it was important. But actually, the hut, the inside of the hut, has all been very carefully taken out and is um, has been rebuilt down in the in the village in the Royal Dahl Museum. A great museum. So yeah, the museum. It's all there now. Yeah, I saw it there. Totally, Chloe. Have you been um, to the museum? You yeah, I love. Museum? Yeah, I went to the museum last year. I loved it. And then so like, you saw the hut. So yeah, yes. I saw the hut. I saw the real thing, and then I walked to the uh, graveyard and saw the, you know, the the Pelly and me rhyme and the BFG footsteps and lost it. So that was really good. <laughs> it was great for me. <laughs> More sad stories, everyone. Um, <sighs> Chloe, I know you you grew up in LA, but how often did you go to Great Missenden and, and visit? Well, we went about once a year or once every two years. It was oh, always nice. such a treat getting to go. Totally. How long did you get to hang out? Uh, a week. Always a week. That's pretty yeah. good. And sometimes we'd stay in London and go in, and sometimes we'd stay at the house. But either way, we were always there when a lot of the family was there, so it was like a family reunion every year. It was great. And was he, like, grandpa or grandfather, like, very formal? He died when I was two months old. Oh, no! So, but so I was one of the only grandchildren that didn't get to meet him. Well, I got to meet him, but didn't get to know him. Poor right, Chloe. Right. Poor Chloe. <laughs> More cider for you. I'm sorry. Good grief. Uh, well, you guys, can I ask you a couple of questions from the fans? Do you mind? Yes. No. Right. Yes, please. And for everyone um, who wrote in, and just so you guys know, we had a contest for those who were asking questions. And the winner gets a um, limited edition tote bag for Matilda the musical. It's very fabulous, excellent. Oh, so, I think Chloe, didn't you? Didn't you? Didn't you? I, su I submit. <laughs> I submitted a question. Oh, a few did you? Ago to try and, you and win. Your I didn't trunk, win. Your trunk full of hoodie. Oh, we're gonna send you your hoodie. The hoodie is in I'll the mail. I'll resubmit though. next time. The medium medium size hoodie is coming to you anyway. Um, cool. So we have a question from Lisa at Lisa Nella. The question is, what makes Fantastic Mr. Fox a timeless children's classic? I think um, it's a different answer to what I usually answer to his other stories. I think it's it's timeless. Timeless in a way, it, it's almost in a time capsule rather than it's timeless. Mm -hmm. um, but it has captured the countryside of England. Um, back in the day, so to speak, you know, when the farmers really lived all around us and the animals, you know, the animals are all still there, but but 
it everything is changing and, and everything's changing you know the the sadly that the main farmer in our village they they sold the farm to some builders and mm. and um, they built they built some sort of housing on on their land and they moved further out so for me I think it's just kind of a really marvelous time capsule of uh, England how it how it used to be that's so nice does that sound, does that make sense? Yeah, that's amazing. That's beautiful. I love it. Yeah. It's a nice way to read it, too, to read it back again with that in mind. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, well, this is going to be a tricky one, and this is for both of you, then. If you can think of it, you win. Um, Sam at Sammy McClusky asks, what's your favorite quote from the book? So if you don't know a specific quote, that's allowed, but maybe a favorite moment or something like that. Mine is the Boggess and Bunsen Bean song. Boggess totally. and Bunsen Bean. I actually not a song. I can. I have known this. I have known this poem since the book was written. Oh. Boggess and Bunsen Bean. One fat, one short, one lean. There's horrible crooks, so different in looks, but nonetheless equally mean. So that that that's mine. Bravo. Uh, that would have to be mine too, because when we were read these stories when we were little, she would actually sing that part. Oh well, that counts. Amazing. <laughs> so my sister and I can. Bop along to it. I can see that. Did you? Did she used to do the voices of the characters? Yes, she would. Uh -huh. She would, and with the rhyme, she'd make she'd make them rhyme very well. In the song, she would sing. Good performing. A good storyteller. I yeah. know. Quite, quite a performer. You think that you just get me for, to put on a party hat, <laughs> yeah, but you haven't. You haven't even asked me to do anything else yet. <laughs> oh, that's next month then. You wait and see. It's coming. Uh, okay, I have another question from Cindy at Alpha Jones. What is the best trick Mr. Fox plays? Trick that he plays? Yeah. Plays on, upon somebody. Um, to dig down. Yeah, dig, to dig down. down. Dig yeah. down, 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 dig down. I think that's a pretty brilliant trick. Totally. Um, or when, when uh, with the meat, when he knocked the dogs out. Oh yeah, that was when good. he was breaking in. in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was good. I just, didn't. You just love the film when they would have the the. Oh, the and... exes. <laughs> oh, and what the cuss? That's my favorite. Yes, yes, what the cuss. <laughs> so, um, Sarah Fisher at Flyfish MT four oh six asks: Is Mrs. Fox based on anybody that he knew? Yes. Do you know the answer to that question? My grandmother. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Really? My mother. Yes. Yes, my mother. And she, when the film came out, she walked around the world telling everybody that she is Mrs. Fox. She was an actress. Um, she she passed away three years ago, um, and but she was a great actress and she loved she attention. Was. And uh, their their um, yeah. even though the fox was 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 in the film named Felicity. Mm. Which, um, which is my stepmother's name. Right. My my mother actually uh, liked to to um, what's the word? Uh, Beg to differ on that one, and and she sort of staunchly said she actually she said to my stepmother as well. She said, "I am the real Mrs. Fox." <laughs> so um, they were great friends, my mother and the and my stepmother. So it was kind of a, it was a sweet sort of um, uh, rivalry between them of, of who really was Mrs. Fox. That's pretty incredible that they were friends. And very, very cool of both of them that that happened. No. Yeah, they were. They were. They were great friends, lifelong great friends. In oh. fact, my mother, my mother said when my stepmother uh, married my father, she said to her, "I had him at his best. Now you can have him." <laughs> <laughs> Good for her. Get one in there. Spectac and also, of course, the fact that she's portrayed by Meryl Streep, not too shabby. So it was definitely your mom. Come on. I know, right? One to another, it has to be. Seriously. Um, I have another question from Babar Solman at B. Sue. Who is your favorite character in the book aside from Mr. Fox himself? Chloe? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking. Oh, I'll tell you who yeah, my favorite yeah. one is. Um, in the book or the film? In in the film, mm -hmm. I have to say Ratty. Yes. Because I think Ratty's Ratty's kind of a brilliant villain. Um, and in the book, Mrs. Fox. She's she's oh. really she's a remarkable fox, as as Mr. Fox says to her. 
She gets the job done too. Yeah, she does. She does. She doesn't mess around. She's she's in and out. Exactly. I like the kids because I feel like I can place who, who who's who out of your family and who's the inspiration for each of them. Huh. Yeah, who? Who I do you think? <laughs> probably who you. I think you're probably the mischievous <laughs> I am, one. I am. I'm the, yeah. I'm the most and the sport and the athletic one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. See, I got it all. <laughs> <laughs> she, she wants more birthday presents. <laughs> <laughs> Working for more than that T-shirt. Get you, you do it. You can do it. By the end of the day, there's plenty of day left for you guys. Uh, Christina Quintos at uh, Chris Quinto asks, "What was Roll Doll's writing process for the Fox?" And you've sort of talked about this a little bit already. That it was inspired by the tree. Um, but did he write the book like any other in Grey Mizzenden in the Hut? Yes, he wrote. He wrote in Grey Mizzenden in the hut, and the hut is in the. It's at the end of a path. Did you go to the house when you were there? No, no, the house wasn't open. It was just okay. just to the museum. Well, next time you're there, let me know, and I'll Done. take you into the house. Sold. Um, <laughs> it was the hut was at the end of of the garden, at the base of the orchard. So, ah. in actual fact, when my father was writing all all of the time, except for when he was writing Fox, he had a piece of plastic. Over the window, so because he said that he would daydream out into the the fields and the woods beyond. Um, but when he was writing Fox, he had the curve, the plastic. It was just a old piece of of, plastic, of very thick, cloudy plastic. Wow. Um, he took that down when he was writing Fox because he wanted to look out and you could actually see, you know, the bunny rabbits hopping around and, <laughs> and that sort of thing. And and um, so that was a big a big part of the process. That's so cool. I love it. Um, Laura at Laura KB, MKB asks, what was the collaboration between Roldal and Quentin Blake and the other illustrators? Collabor they, they, were, they were great friends. And um, when my father used different illustrators for all of his books mm -hmm. uh, right up until when he met Quentin. And then when he met Quentin, he it was it was it was like salt and pepper. It was like you know cheese and pickle. It was they they were they they were a perfect fit. They they just and they were so sweet to to see them together because my father was huge and Quentin is tiny. Oh. Um, and Quentin would look up at him and my dad would look down at Quentin. Um, but they had the same sense of humor. They laughed at the same things. Um, they really understood each other. And uh, Sir Quentin now actually he just got knighted, um, and and I, Dad was really 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 pleased when he met Quentin, and and they were more than work work buddies. Quentin used to come to dinner all of the time. He would come for Sunday lunch all of the time, um, and my father was always very excited. Uh, I remember when when he wrote. The, the witches, I was there and Quentin was to come down for lunch and he was bringing the illustrations for the witches to show to show dad. Oh. And he, he laid them out on the, on the, we all went up into the snooker room and uh, he laid them out on the snooker table and, and everyone was just over the moon and thrilled. It's kind of a, kind of a really remarkable process to, to have witnessed um, see, seeing that. To see those actual sketches on the, I mean before they Oh, it's incredible. That's so and, cool. And, and my father's first reaction to them and yeah. how you know excited he was. But he was also, you know, he said, I think that we should do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and change this up. And, and, and Quentin is a very gentle, gentle man. Um, and my father was, was a larger-than-life character. Mm. Um, he was very much an alpha, my father. And uh, it worked very well with, with their personalities, too. It sounds I mean, like I a little, it's like little Hutt and Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a great thing. I just don't that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, fine. You have to take it. It's fine. Adam J. Adam J. wouldn't. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Good shout out. <laughs> uh, so um, <laughs> I just have a question. Cheese and pickles. Do you eat those together often? You said uh, you like cheese and pickles. <laughs> Branston. Branston pickles. Uh, oh. Cheese and Branston pickles. Yes, definitely. Mm. Not not pickles. Not not American pickles. Is that I think when we pickle? have a thing called. Branston pickle. How would you describe Branston pickle? It's like a brown spread that has pieces of pickle in it. 
It's kind of like Marmite in a way. Oh, uh, it tastes yeah. completely different, but you either love it or you hate it, and it's, I love it. It's vinegary. It's, it's so good. Yeah. It's kind of it's vinegary in a way, so that the English people eat um, fish and chips. Yeah. It's that. It's um, no, it's sort of chips with salt and vinegar on them. It's got that same uh, salt and savory taste to it. It's oh, okay. fantastic. Can Brand you get that in LA? Stuff. Can you? Is that something you can pick up at the store where you are now? Yeah. At Irish import stores, you can. You can oh, get proper. it at the at the stores that sell English things. Well done, guys. Well done. <laughs> okay, I have one more question, and then we'll announce the winner of the tote bag live on air. Uh, the question is from Eric Gelb at Director Gelb. What's the most important message in the book to you? I would say to never give up. And I would also say, sorry, I'm stealing your thunder. No, no, I, I would no, also, I would also say, uh, love conquers all. Ooh, good ones. Mm. To never give up, and and that love, trust, friendship. Is that what you were going to say? No, I was going to be be quick enough not to lose your tail. <laughs> be quick enough not to lose your tail. Well done, excellent. Because otherwise, we will hang it in our kitchen. The collection is getting so large, you guys. Uh, so I'm going to announce to all those who are watching, the winner of the fabulous tote bag is Laura for, from Laura MKB. Hooray! Well done, we send Laura. you a tote bag. And Chloe, we send you a birthday hoodie, I swear. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> thank you. It's going to be amazing. Um, so guys, I want to thank you so much for hanging out. And thank you, Chloe, for being our extra special guest star on your birthday, no less. Uh, and hope this means extra birthday presents for you somehow, with all the good good, de good deeds you've been doing. Yeah, well done, well done. Um, well, I'm going to have to whip up a cake. <laughs> yeah, exactly, no pressure. Um, and I do want to announce next month's book club book. It is, and Lucy, I think you'll like this, it is The Twits. Oh, yay. That's my favorite book. Yeah, see? That's my absolute favorite book. Oh, uh, it's so, oh, it's amazing. So everyone read The Twits, please, in October, and we'll talk all about it and things stuck in your beard and stuff. Um, and also, please celebrate Doll Month all month long. We have, obviously, today's Hangout, which was amazing. We have lots of other activities coming up. Tomorrow is Roald Dahl's birthday, so celebrate Doll Day by reading a book and seeing Matilda and, uh, you know. Reading a book on Doll Day? Read it. You want them to read a book in a day? Yes, I do. Read the uh, short story. I, I would be pleased if you read the chapter. That's fine. <laughs> Listen, I'm I'm the hard case. It's good cop, bad cop. And the hangouts, okay? That's just how we roll. Uh, but thank you so much, everybody who tuned in. And thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Chloe. Two generations of dolls on the screen. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.